Hi, it's Justin. Um, so what you're about to watch is the first hour of the uh, lecture I did on um, overcoming the monster. Um, just a housekeeping note, I had to cut out most of the video clips here. So you'll see me mention uh, the video clips and then they're very, very truncated and short. And I had to do that just to get get it up on YouTube, even though technically these clips are fair use. Um, it's too much trouble to try and, and go and, and uh, fight with these companies over every little clip that I have on here. So someday if this turns into a course, uh, you'll have full access to the videos. Um, but um, I would say you should be familiar with Jaws, uh, High Noon, the Western with Gary Cooper, and um, uh, Jurassic Park, if you really want to get the most out of this. So without further ado, uh, here is the lecture. Hi, this is Justin, and um, I want to just continue right ahead with our discussion on the seven basic plots. Last time we talked about rags to riches and uh, today I want to talk to you guys about overcoming the monster. Now, um, whoops. this is kind of how I've been thinking about it. Uh, I borrowed this concept from David Brooks. Um, he's got a, a concept about a life cycle as uh, consisting of two mountains. <clears throat> so all of the plots, you, you might be able to think of them as um, generally, generally um, following um, a, a whole life cycle, right? Now, the two mountains are the mountain of success here and the mountain of legacy. So it has to do with uh, first becoming competent in the world, first learning how to um, accomplish things, how to survive, how to um, uh, build communities and, and, and build uh, cities and towns and, and uh, defeat, uh, defeat your enemies, you might say. Um, and so that's the success mountain. That's the first mountain. And rags to riches, like we talked about last time, it really starts here at the bottom. And it's, it's about getting to the top of this uh, success mountain. It's about going from obscurity to recognition. It's about going from uh, pure potential to actually accomplishing something. Um, and then, so you can think about these three, voyage and return, which we'll talk about later, overcoming the monster, which I'm going to talk about today, and rags to riches as kind of being in general over here uh, on the slope towards uh, success. Uh, now, David Brooks in, um, oh gosh, I forgot the name of the book right now, but uh, I'll put it down in the comments. David Brooks um, wrote about the two mountains and uh, how generally the first half of life is about success, right? It's about uh, getting an education. It's about finding your place in the world, like finding your vocation, finding uh, your mate who you're going to partner with, uh, establishing yourself from your old family into a new family, right? From the family that you were born into the, to the family that you're going to create, however that looks. And um, and and basically providing a, a, an area of safety for yourself. Um, one concept that I think is very helpful in all this is this notion of habitable order, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But you create this space of habitable order, and these plots, I think, are generally about achieving it and maintaining it. And uh, it has a lot to do with uh, illegitimate versus legitimate um, authority, illegitimate versus legitimate rule. Right, so if you're going to have the responsibility to be the head of a company, or to run a business, or to uh, have a family, or uh, to be uh, an upstanding citizen in the community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you need to learn how to carve out that space of habitable order and have a measure of success. And this kind of success, there's really two kinds of success, but this this one on the first mountain is the success of career, money. Um, romance, um, you know, all of the things that kind of you want in life, all of the accomplishments that you want in life. Okay, so then we could think about tragedy here. Comedy to tragedy is really the transition from this mountaintop down to the valley. Now, one, one of the things that you'll notice is that oftentimes rags to riches and comedy end up with a wedding. 
And then a tragedy is the devolution of that wedding, the decay of that wedding, right? So there's a certain principle uh, that exists in the world, apparently, <laughs> that um, once you've carved out a space of order for yourself, that order will corrupt or it'll go stale or you know there'll be problems with it tragedy is really about the fall it's the fall from this mountaintop of success down into this valley okay and that's where the the quest picks up the quest plot type this is dante lost in the woods in the valley and now he's got to go up a second mountain and what's the second mountain uh the second mountain is legacy Right? So the second mountain is really not about achieving success for yourself. It's about passing on the wisdom, the knowledge, uh, the wealth, the possessions, um, the know-how, um, everything that's valuable in life uh, on beyond your own uh, individual life to your community, to your offspring. So success in this mountain might look like um, material success, more like material success, and it might look like, uh, you know, um, fame and recognition, right, uh, for your accomplishments. And then that's sort of coupled with um, the attractiveness to the opposite sex that you have and your success in finding a mate, right? So that's all here on this mountain. And then the second half, the legacy half is now, once you have all that, right, that it, that you have the midlife crisis. That's the quest story is really a midlife crisis story. And then rebirth, which is going to be the final plot that we look at, is really about passing on all of that knowledge on the second mountain after you've kind of recovered from this valley on to the next generation, right? So the successful, um, the successful transcending of your own life. So, uh, that might look like, um, uh, you know, having children, having grandchildren, or, uh, you know, the work that you do, uh, your, the songs that you write, and the plays that you write, and the films that you were in, and the, and the books that you write, you know, being preserved for posterity, you know, the time capsule thing. Um, passing on the story of your community, of your country, of your organization, of your family, right? Passing that on to the next generation. Okay, so that's that's just a, a brief sketch of sort of how all these plots work together. But today, um, I want to talk about overcoming the monster. Uh, as, uh, like I said, it does seem to kind of pick up where rags to riches um, left off. Rags to riches is this idea of uh, someone coming, uh, a diamond in the rough, who is ignored and overlooked, finally becoming recognized and becoming competent and um, uh, ready for legitimate rule, taking over a kingdom, taking dominion of a kingdom, you might say, uh, ruling as a king and queen, right? Uh, a king or queen. Um, okay, so so what's the, what's the overcoming the monster story about? Oftentimes what you'll find is it starts with a place of habitable order that's already been carved out in the world and then there's a threat to it from the outside. If Rags to Riches is about establishing that place of habitable order, building that place of habitable order and competence, overcoming the monster is about preserving it, right? So here's some things that I want you to think about. These are some, I think, uh, very profound um, philosophical concepts bound up uh, with this plot type, overcoming the monster. And that's this, the anti-name. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Now, here's, here's something that's interesting about trying to teach somebody something. Uh, let's say you want to you wanna keep somebody safe. And you say, remember, do this, 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 and this when you encounter this, 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 and this, right? Um, or let's say you want to teach somebody how to how to grow a garden, and it's like make sure you pull out the weeds, make sure you put in the, you water it this many times, right? But what happens, right, when something unexpected happens to that garden? Let's say you know some locusts come by or some some pest, you know, a, a gopher starts eating at the roots of your of your uh, of your plant. You never you don't know what it might be. It might be a frost, right? It might be uh, any number of things that could threaten your garden, right? 
So when I tell you, let's say I'm the master gardener and I tell you, here's how you grow a garden, right? And you follow all my rules, okay? And then I'm gone, right? And now you're in charge of the garden and something unexpected happens. What do you do? I didn't, I didn't give you specific instructions for that. I can't because I don't know all of the contingencies that could happen out there. So there's a certain skill in competent ruling that consists of knowing what to do when the unexpected happens, okay? So I'm calling that the anti-name, okay? And we'll get back to that. The second concept that I think you should remember are garments of skin. Now, these are both concepts taken from the book of Genesis, by the way. Um, garments of skin, and it's this idea that you need a little death to protect yourself from death. You need a little death to protect yourself from death. I'm not going to I'm not going to explain these right now. I'm hoping that this will become evident as we move forward. Okay, so you know, monster stories are darn near universal. I mean, uh, they exist in in Asian cultures, uh, South American, uh, all throughout the Americas, Europe certainly, the Middle East, Africa. Um, and they, they exist in your dreams, right? These are, these are figures that are universal. But why? <laughs> why are they like that? Um, this is just an amalgamation of a, a whole bunch of different depictions of monsters all throughout history. Let's, let's take a look at a couple. All right. Probably one of the oldest uh, stories, overcoming the monster stories, is the biblical story of David and Goliath, right? You have uh, the children of Israel um, existing in a little island of tranquility, right, that's been carved out by Yahweh um, to live inside. It's, it's habitable order, right? And it's threatened by this Philistine giant from the outside. And what is required in the story is that a young hero will come up and challenge the monster, challenge the monster, and behead it. Interesting, interesting symbolic concept of beheading something. Uh, keep that in mind as well. Um, in order to restore uh, peace and tranquility within uh, the community, right? There's a sense that you cannot live, you cannot go about your daily life when there's a huge threat coming from the outside. Right? And that's what you're going to see with these plots. So you're going to have this dynamic between the inside and the outside. Right? There are people that are living inside of the city gates, let's say, or the, the, the ordered world of the town, and they don't take the threat from the outside seriously enough. Okay. Um, and then there's also the question of why the threat manifests itself in the first place. So that's another question to, to keep in mind. Um, now, as you get up, uh, you know, a few centuries after Christ and you get into the realm of the Vikings, um, you get to another overcoming the monster story, another very old overcoming the monster story of Beowulf, right? What, what's this? I don't, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Beowulf, but it um, essentially is very similar to David and Goliath, right? Um, there is a king and a kingdom. Uh, peacefully living uh, in a town, and this monster comes out of a lake, out of a lair, and threatens the inhabitants of this community. And what's required is for a young hero named Beowulf to confront the monster. Um, in the first instance, he pulls off his arm, and then eventually he... Uh, confronts the terrible mother of the monster. And the, the, the point the, of the simple story is that you cannot live, you cannot go about your business while those monsters are out there that are threatening your community. Okay, so it's a universal story. Um, but what's the deal with the monster? Okay, um, who is Goliath? Who is uh, Grindel? Um, who is the shark in Jaws, the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Um, 
the monsters underneath your bed or in your closet when you're when you're a, ch a child uh, that that scare you, right? Why does the monster always live in the dark? Why does the monster always have a a layer, a stinky, smelly, wet, damp layer? All right, so this is this is actually from the Middle Ages here, and this is a this is an amalgamation of animal parts and human parts, right? You've got the head of a, of a person. Now, this is a, a corrupt pope. This was uh, to, de to depict a pope that had, had been corrupted. Um, and he's got the body of some kind of a reptile, the claws of some kind of a reptile, or maybe even bird-like claws, um, the wings of a bird, the horns of a hooved animal, and the face of a man and here's a here's a serpent down here okay so think of this in the in the garden of eden when uh, well let, let, let's go all the way back to the beginning of genesis genesis 1 elohim creates the heavens and the earth right what does elohim do how does elohim create this place of habitation for uh the human, the 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 atom, the human that he is about to make. Well, he divides, separates, and names. Divides, separates, and names. Right? He divides the night from the day. He puts a light in the night in the day and a light in the night. Right? He calls the light in the day the sun. He calls the light in the uh, night the stars. He separates the waters from the dry land. He calls the waters the sea. He calls the dry land the earth. He separates the birds from the fish. He separates the livestock from the beasts, and he names every time, and then he assesses whether or not it's good. Okay, so this is a, this is really a, an idea for how our consciousness works, right? So if I'm going to create some habitable order for myself to live inside, um, it means that I need to kind of put everything in its place and I need to put a name. I need to attach a label, put a name on it, right? And that's what I'm doing when I uh, create my living space or when we create our communities, right? Or when we create our laws, our rules, our, our governorships. Um, what's the monster then? The monster is something that does not have a name. It is actually the name for the unnamed, right? So all of these things, the, the, the claws, the snake-like tail, uh, the wings, um, you know, all of these things are potential threats. These are all things that could happen. So like, remember I was talking about the garden, right? And I say, okay, well, what if I'm telling you how to plant a garden? And I tell you about the fertilizer, tell you about the seeds, tell you about the weeds, everything. And I say, but however, there might be something that I don't know about and you don't yet know about that could threaten your garden. And the name for that is monster, right? And it's an amalgamation in your mind of all of these different threatening elements. And as that monster becomes more familiar to you, then the particularities of that one entity will be shed away. But this is a universal category for the set of all things threatening, you might say. So it's a name for the unnamed. Okay, a mishmash of parts for all future threats combined. And it wants what it wants. It's pure ego, right? It doesn't abide by the rule. It's, there's, a, there's an interesting thing, like if a, if a monster in a movie is, is not a creature, it, maybe it's a human being. Um, what you'll find is that it it still has this mishmash of parts in the sense that it's not predictable. It often seems to have a supernatural quality, and and what that means is just that it it it's not going to follow the rules that you're familiar with because it's from beyond your understanding. You haven't mapped out what it is capable of yet because you're not familiar with it, right? Um, so the layer. The lair of the dragon is what? It's a place that exists outside of your realm of habitable order, 
but it's a place that you need to go in order to solve the problem. So there's treasure always in the dragon's lair, right? It, it is smelly and uncomfortable and dark and maybe filled with death, but it's got this treasure. Why, why, the, why the dichotomy? Why the, why the uh, juxtaposition of death and treasure? That which is most valuable and that which is most destructive are combined in the lair of the monster. Okay. So, is that on the recording? It did, probably. <laughs> okay, this is, a, a, like I said, just a, to underscore the point that these monsters are universal. This, is, this comes from Chinese culture, a dragon. Uh, this is a medieval painting of Alexander the Great uh, fighting these weird, multi-headed, uh, dog-faced, multi-eyed, um, eagle-taloned, <laughs> snake-tailed creatures, right? Uh, and then if you, you go on up into the Middle Ages, you've got these legends of overcoming the monster stories of uh, knights and heroes encountering dragons. This is St. George and the dragon. This is essentially an, an archetypal story, uh, a universal story. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to play this video that will give you kind of an overview of the plot of St. George and the Dragon. I want to I do this. I want to give you some background of how universal this story is so that when we get up to our modern movie renditions of this story, you'll see how they're really tapping into a very, very deep, deep root uh, that goes back centuries. Okay, so let's take a look at this. St. George was a knight and born in Cappadocia. On a time he came into the province of Libya, to a city which is said Silene. And by this city was a stagny, or a pond like a sea, wherein was a dragon which envenomed all of the country. And on a time the people were assembled for to slay him, but when they saw him, they fled. And when he came nigh the city, he venomed the people with his breath. And therefore the people of the city gave to him every day two sheep for to feed him, because he should do no harm to the people. And when the sheep failed, there was taken a man and a sheep. Then was an ordinance made in the town, that there should be taken the children and young people of them of the town by lot. And every each one, as it fell, where he gentle or poor, should be delivered when the lot fell on him or her. So it happened that many of the town were then delivered, insomuch that the lot fell upon the king's daughter, whereof the king was sorry, and said unto the people, For the love of the gods, take gold and silver and all that I have, and let me keep my daughter. They said, How, sir, ye have made and ordained the law, and our children be now dead. And ye would do the contrary? Your daughter shall be given, or else we shall burn you and your house. When the king saw he might do no more, he began to weep, and said to his daughter, Now shall I never see thine espousals. Then returned he to the people, and demanded eight days respite. And when the eight days were passed, they came to him and said, Thou seest that the city perisheth. Then did the king do array his daughter, like as she should be wedded, and embraced her, kissed her, and gave her his benediction, and after led her to the place where the dragon was. When she was there, St. George passed by, and when he saw the lady, he demanded the lady what she made there, and she said, Go ye your way, fair young man, that ye perish not also. Then said he, Tell to me what have ye, and why weep ye, and doubt ye of no thing. When she saw that he would know, she said to him how she was delivered to the dragon. Then said St. George, Fair daughter, doubt ye no thing hereof, for I shall help thee in the name of Jesu Christ. She said, For God's sake, good knight, go your way, and abide not with me, for ye may not deliver me. Thus, as they spake together, the dragon appeared and came running to them. And St. George was upon his horse and drew out his sword and garnished him with the sign of the cross. 
and rode hardly against a dragon, which came towards him and smote him with his spear, and hurt him sore, and threw him to the ground. And after said to the maid, Deliver to me your girdle, and bind it about the neck of the dragon, and be not afeard. When she had done so, the dragon followed her, as he had been a meek beast and debonair. And she led him into the city, and the people fled by the mountains and the valleys, and said, Alas, alas, we shall all be dead. Then St. George said to them, Nay, doubt ye no thing, without more believe ye in God, Jesus Christ, and do ye to be baptized, and I shall slay the dragon. Then the king was baptized, and all his people, and St. George slew the dragon, and smote off his head, and commanded that he should be thrown in the fields. And they took four carts with oxen that drew him out of the city. Then there were there well fifteen thousand men baptized, without women and children. And the king did do make a church there, of Our Lady and of St. George, in which yet soundeth a fountain of living water, which healeth sick people that drink thereof. After this, the king offered to St. George as much money as there might be numbered, but he refused all, and commanded that it should be given to the poor people for God's sake, and enjoined the king four things, that he should have charge of the churches, and that he should honor the priests and hear their service diligently, and that he should have pity on the poor people, and after kissed the king and departed. So that, that little story um, has a lot of symbols in it, a lot of meaning. It's, it's, it's just packed with meaning. <laughs> um, so just keep that in mind. I wanted to show you a whole story, uh, at least in brief, because what I'm going to be doing from now on is uh, showing you movie clips of each of the constituent parts of this plot type. And uh, so just keep the whole in mind, uh, the idea that there's a place of habitable order that's relatively peaceful, that has been carved out in the chaotic world, threatened by a predator from the outside and the necessary, uh, the necessity uh, for uh, a hero to arise in order to confront that threat. Okay, so as with nearly everything else, <laughs> Uh, it always goes back to the garden, doesn't it? Um, this is from uh, from a, a painter from Antwerp, Antwerp uh, named Bruegel. Um, I love uh, all of the Bruegel uh, painters. Um, but here you have the garden, okay? And and remember, um, we we're talking about uh, how Elohim in Genesis one uh, separates, divides, names, and then he gives Adam the man, the human that he has created to live in this place of order uh, and peace um, with the task of naming the animals, right? And so there's a sense that we are always creating in the pattern that Elohim creates in the Genesis story in uh, whatever we do, right? Um, when I uh, just think about your house, Right? I'm, I'm putting things where they go so that I can live, right? so, that, so that it makes it easy for me to live. Um, what I'm doing is I'm when, I, when you organize your home, let's just, you know, when you're um, arranging your furniture and you're saying, okay, the dishes go here and the couch goes here and the bedroom goes here and you get all that worked and you get that space done you enter into a little mini Sabbath rest, right? Now, it's very, very interesting. Recently, I was researching this concept of sabot, the ancient Jewish notion of rest, and it's not exactly what you would think. Um, sabot, or Sabbath rest, was described as the place in the palace from which the king would rule, right? So it's not necessarily... Um, a place where you don't do any work, where you just lounge around and drink a Mai Tai. It's not like vacation rest. Um, rather, what it is, is it's, it's everything is now set up. You've eliminated chaos from your environment so you can focus on what you need to focus on. You can do the work that you need to do. Think about what it's like when uh, your room is 
or your office or your desk is full of clutter, right? It's very hard to work. It's hard to get things done. So once you clean and organize, you can enter a place of rest, right? You can enter a place of rest. And so there's a sense that the garden is that place of rest carved out in the world. And then what happens? What happens? Uh, oh, here's the named animals, right? Notice this. <laughs> these are these are fluffy little creatures, right? A, a dog, a rabbit, you know, a little monkey or something, a bird at the feet of the human beings, right? These are these are domesticated animals. When you go in and you create an environment of habitable order for yourself, you are naming and domesticating. What you're doing, domestication, I think, is you're, you're putting something that you have knowledge of in your environment, right? You, you kind of know, you train your dog. You train the wild animal out of your dog in some sense. The other day I was walking down the hall here. And there was a a woman that lives down the hall, and she's very, very petite, but she's got this massive dog, right? And that dog saw me and for whatever reason thought that I was an intruder into their domicile, right? The dog does not know the human contract that we have in the sense that all of us share the hallway in this building where I have my studio, right? Um, and that dog was foaming at the mouth teeth bared. And if it wasn't for the fact that she held that dog back, it would have bit me, I think. Um, and uh, I looked into its wild eyes and I thought, thank God, you know, she's got a handle on it. But she almost couldn't. I mean, that dog was half her size. <laughs> and so she was pulling the dog into her, uh, into her apartment. She's apologizing to me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're trying to train it out of him. We're trying to train it out of him. And I thought, okay, interesting. So that's, that's the naming, right? The naming is also applying law, applying rule to that animal, right? So you're taking that which is outside, which is unpredictable, wild, primordial, right? You're bringing it into your environment and you're raising it up in a sense in that you are putting it in its place. You are giving it a role. Okay, I'm the human. I'm the master. You're the dog. And now we establish this covenantal relationship in some sense between the, the beast and the human, right? And that creates a realm of peace, right? Because the dog now knows, okay, the dog goes and lays down on his blanket, doesn't try to jump up on the table, right? All of that stuff, all of that is nested, is, is embedded with this idea of naming. Okay, so remember what I said about the monster as that which has no name, right? The monster is the part of that dog that hasn't been domesticated yet, right? Okay, so what happens in these overcoming the monster stories? Well, a predator, somebody who or something who doesn't go by the rules inside those walls enters in, okay? Um, or enters um, your space, right? Uh, attacks the walls of your space, right? And this is the threat. This is the universal threat, okay? And, uh, you know, if you think about it in terms of life, this is always happening, right? And, and I think that's why these monsters reside in your dreams, right? If you have a stress dream, right? Um, a stress dream is is what right there's chaos in your life there's something that you have not figured out yet or there's something that's giving you anxiety and then in your subconscious while you're sleeping at night it manifests itself as a monster right so in, in a sense you might think that you, your your brain is saying there's there's there are unknowns out there that threaten whatever it is you're trying to do. The peace that you have created, the Sabbath rest, the subboat that you have created is now threatened by something and it's represented by this nameless being that comes from the outside to threaten that environment that you've created. 
Okay, so you can kind of think of the overcoming the monster story. We can move into the um, into the uh, movies now. Um, in screenwriting, you have this term called the ordinary world. That's the um, that's the state of affairs prior to the conflict arising in the story. And this is the Garden of Eden over here. This is the Sabbath rest over here. I'm going to use two movies. Uh, well, I'll use a couple. I'll use maybe three, but primarily two movies um, to, uh, to illustrate the overcoming the monster story. I'm going to use a Western, High Noon, with Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly here. They are getting married on a Sunday at the beginning of High Noon. They are living in a peaceful town of Sabbath rest prior to the entrance of the of the threat okay this is amityville island uh, filmed in martha's vineyard of jaws it's the same thing a vacation town a place of rest a place of rest and tranquil tranquility okay the garden of eden right and then what happens generally you now have a border between the place of rest I'll do it over here because that's where the, <laughs> uh, between the place of rest over here, the Sabbath rest, the garden, right? The habitable order. And then you've got a border and then you've got the outside world. And the outside world, you could call chaos, the waters of chaos, primordial chaos, um, represented in Jaws by the ocean, right? And represented very brilliantly, very creatively in um, High Noon as these train tracks, the train tracks that will bring Frank Miller, the monster, into town on the noon train. And then out beyond the border, out in the lair of the dragon, in the lake with Grendel, uh, in Beowulf, or in the cave of the dragon, um, in uh, uh, St. George and the Dragon, um, or you know, in the in the in the ocean, you've got this confrontation uh, with the dragon. Now, in High Noon, the confrontation takes place inside the town, but the idea is that somehow this border is breached, and the hero is now um, required to confront this dragon. In even though the hero doesn't want to. Okay, so that's kind of the landscape of uh, of overcoming the monster. Let me just show you the beginning of Jaws here. This is the this is the Garden of Eden section of the story. This is usually, well, oftentimes a, a, um, a story will start with a, a, little a little teaser, a little taste of the thread out there, but then go in and establish the, um, establish the, the, the garden, the Garden of Eden, the, the place of rest. And here's how they do it in Jaws. Mom, I got cut. I got hit by a vampire. You guys were playing on those swings. When, those swings are dangerous. Stay off there. I haven't yeah. fixed it. Not like you did last week. 15, 20 minutes. All right? Enjoy your... All right, nobody's even here yet. <laughs> Be careful, will you? In this town? Hey. Hi, okay. <laughs> Poor, naive Sheriff Brody, Chief Brody. Um, he thinks that the biggest problem with chaos, the biggest threat, is going to be the rusty swing set that cut his son's hand, right? Little does he know what lies out there beyond the border, right? And and that's kind of that's kind of how it is, right? You're concerned with the with cleaning up your room, cleaning up your house, your town, um, until all of that is thrown out the window when a larger threat manifests itself. But again, it, it, remember with rags to riches, it starts with a child being oppressed and needing to rise up through society. Um, and here, the, pretty much everything is established. This is why I really think that it's, it's um, appropriate to say that overcoming the monster picks up where rags to riches left off. Like somebody has built this safe little town. Somebody has, and, and now he's the inheritor of it, right? Now in, in High Noon, You've got the, the protagonist, again, is a sheriff. And the star that represents law and order in the Western is very, very symbolic in that sense. The outlaw lives outside of the law. The outlaw, really, you could say, is the snake, right? The snake doesn't 
in the garden does not follow the rules of Yahweh, right? Um, the outlaws don't follow the rules of the town, just like the dog from down the street, right? A wild dog doesn't follow the rules that we have in this building, right? The dog gets out in this building and that's a monster, right? <laughs> so um, you establish this, this place of tranquility. Now, uh, here's uh, talking about the landscape of the story is worth a little bit more exploration. Now, this is a this is a great little book called Sea Monsters on Medieval and Renaissance Maps. <laughs> and um, uh, these are all creatures that are drawn on the maps outside of the mapped territory. And that this is what you're going to find. A map is a perfect, perfect metaphor for this. Here is a map of Iceland from 1585 by Abraham Ortelius. And so here you can see there's this sense of, okay, here's the mapped area. This is the area where we know everything is. We know where the threats are, right? Even there's a volcano here, but that's like, okay, we, we know about that. Um, we know what it does. We can, um, we can keep our distance, whatever it is, you know. But out here beyond the border, you've got these sea monsters, right? And again, it's the same thing. It's, it's all of these parts, you know, you've got weird claws here. This is a whale, but it's got two blowholes. It's got the snout of a pig, you know, um, uh, the head of a horse. Now here's a, this, this pig, um, uh, a sea, I think it's called a sea swine, uh, is, is in multiple places in, in old medieval maps. Um, here's a, a more detail of it, you know. Um, you've got animals here. These are, again, right, the domesticated animals. And this is why I think in Genesis you have a separation between beasts and livestock, right? Because that's kind of how it works, right? You've got the animals that are closer to us are more predictable, they're more domesticated, and then you've got your outer animals that are potential threats. Um, here's a bird of some kind. Oh, I'm, that's behind me, but that's okay. Um, yeah, weird snout, whale, right? Um, now, there's an old tradition in, uh, in medieval manuscripts called marginalia. It's actually a form of art. Very, very interesting. Um, here, I'll hide myself. Uh, so, marginalia is... You know, this is an old Jewish manuscript, and here's a dragon eating an angel. Here's a dragon sort of fighting a deer. Um, and this is where we get the word marginalized from, marginalia. And what exists in the margins? Monsters, things that don't have categories, right? So there's a real connection between marginalization and monsters, marginalia. And uh, so the idea is that the word here, the logos, that's the center, that's the defined world, right? And then outside of the margins, outside of the logos, outside of the center, you've got these, these marginal figures. And really, in, in a way, the, the overcoming the monster story is about what to do about the fact that these figures exist. What to do about the fact that there is part of the world that I know that is familiar to me that's been mapped out, and then there's that, would li that which lies beyond my understanding, my knowledge, my physical location, right? And it's, it's really the quintessential human problem, which is that we don't know everything, right? And, and we are vulnerable in this world, right? Um, we're not God. We're creatures, and um, there are competing interests out there. Okay, so just remember this landscape, okay? You've got your habitable order, your Garden of Eden. You've got the border. We're going to talk more about that, where a threat lies, and you don't exactly know the nature of the threat, and then you finally, you've got this monster that you have to confront. Okay, so now let's look at the heroes, or the characters in that's the landscape, okay, um, and uh, and and now this is the um, these are the characters. So you've got your hero. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but Star Wars is actually an overcoming the monster story. Uh, a lot of people think that it's a quest, but in fact, it is an overcoming the monster story. 
um, and James Bond, all the James Bond movies, right? Those are overcoming the monster stories. Uh, this is uh, Silence of the Lambs, Academy Award winning movie from the um, from uh, the nineties. Um, so you've got the hero over here. You've got the border, and then you've got these these figures that reside on the border. They are liminal figures, right? Uh, those are very, very important to this plot. And then you've got your monster out here. Okay. All right. So let's let's take a look at Jaws here. Um, generally, this is this is kind of how I see it unfolding um, in our archetypal overcoming the monster pattern. Uh, you got your hero. Uh, in this case, uh, Sheriff Brody is in charge of law and order. So he's in charge of making sure that this Garden of Eden, this Sabbath rest place of Amity Island is ordered and is safe and free of threats, right? And then you've got your innocent, and that's the people that are living inside this kingdom. And then you've got your mentor figure and your foolish character. And it's so, so interesting to look at the interaction, the dynamics between the fool and the mentor. And now the usually the mentor, played by Richard, Richard Dreyfus here, has some knowledge of what's out there, some theoretical knowledge, or possibly some experience. And the hero needs that advice. And here, uh, Richard Dreyfus is a scientist, you know, and he studies sharks. Um, and then you've got your fool. And the fool is usually the one that's playing the role. And usually there can be multiple foolish characters. Usually there's one that's absolutely stupid, <laughs> saying exactly the wrong thing. And what are they doing, really? They are refusing to recognize the existence of an outside, refusing to recognize the existence of a threat. They're really in denial. They have a huge blind spot. And the blind spot is this naivete that maybe the problem will just go away. Maybe if we do nothing, the problem will go away. The mentor figure, oh, sorry about that. The mentor figure is the one who's saying, hold on a second. They, they may not have the solution, but what they are saying is the fool is wrong. We need to be careful about this. Okay. Then you've got someone residing on the border. And what does that exactly mean? Well, the border figure in this case is Quint. Uh, the old fisherman, um, has one foot in civilization and one foot in the wild. So the border figure is kind of not really adhering to the rules of Amity Island, of the community, right? But not completely a monster, right on the border. So there's a sense that the hero needs this liminal figure in order to learn about the threat, because this is an unknown threat out here. Okay, so let's let's see how some of this plays out. Here's a here's a map of uh, of of, of um, or a satellite view of um, uh, Martha's Vineyard, and I, I actually had the privilege of of going there on vacation for the Fourth of July one time, and I actually jumped off a of Jaws bridge right here. <laughs> um, okay, so so think of it this way: this realm out here. This is the realm of the lair of the dragon. This is the realm of chaos. This is uh, where the threat is manifesting itself. And then over here, you've got the innocent, the foolish, the hero, the mentor, and then our uh, our liminal figure is going to be out here. Okay, so so that's the landscape. Um, I want to just go over the the five acts of overcoming the monster real quick before I get into to more of this so you can kind of see where we're headed here. Okay, so um, here are the here are the stages. You've got your anticipation stage and that's uh, where the where the, where something out there is lurking. Um, something is breaching the walls of this habitable order of Sabbath rest and tranquility. Then you have a dream stage where uh, Maybe the fool or someone from within the community suggests a solution to this threat, and there's initial, some initial success, but it's not enough. It's not real. It's it's dreamlike. It's a fantasy solution, you know. Um, and then you've got your frustration stage where you actually have to okay, let's let's roll up our sleeves and figure out this problem. 
And then you've got the nightmare stage where you're facing the full force of the dragon or the monster. And then you've got your conclusion, your thrilling escape. Okay, just keep that in mind. You don't have to necessarily memorize all that right now, but keep that in mind as we go through these characters. Okay, so the anticipation stage. I, sh I showed you the ordinary world, the Garden of Eden, but then now what is, comes next in the plot is something out there is lurking. Something is threatening our peace and tranquility. One of the famous things about the filming of Jaws with Steven Spielberg was that the shark wasn't working, um, the mechanical shark. And so he had to find ways to uh, give the essence of the shark without showing it. And uh, in fact, that actually adhered more to the archetype and it helped him. It was a happy accident in some sense. And that's one of the reasons why it was so, so, so successful. Um, you don't see the monster and that's, that's true. You don't know what it is, right? Okay, so let's take a look now at High Noon. Okay, uh, how is the peace and tranquility um, threatened with High Noon? Uh, I'm going to show you a clip that starts right in the beginning. Uh, it, it interrupts the wedding that is taking place between Grace Kelly and uh, Gary Cooper. Train on time. We'll be mighty fast for a Sunday. Okay. All right. Remember that theme of Sabbath rest, moving mighty fast for a Sunday, right? Um, this is the telegram that's going to inform uh, Gary Cooper that uh, an outlaw is on the way right so now the town is threatened the peace is threatened okay i want to show you one other <laughs> uh, example of this from jurassic park um I, I, the reason why i want to do that is because you know these these beats oftentimes are so similar you know so so here's here's how the habitable order is uh, threatened in jurassic park the gate shoot her <laughs> okay so this is right in the beginning right in the beginning of the movie uh, we are establishing this threat and what's important about it you don't see okay now I want to I want to dig a little bit deep. We know the story. We know these stories, right? But, but why? <laughs> why is there something out there lurking? That's the ultimate question, isn't it? You create some order for yourself. And why would this malevolent force be directed towards you? And your, your, the, the, the little place that you've built for yourself. I don't necessarily know if I can give you a universal answer to that, but I think that there are some clues. Um, if you go to any movie, go to any, any Overcoming the, the Monster movie, uh, fast forward to about maybe just past the midpoint, maybe almost two-thirds of the way through, you'll usually find a conversation there where the characters reflect on kind of the meta state they kind of reflect on they're abstracting themselves from the conflict in some sense and 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 pontificating on maybe some bigger some bigger reasons for this conflict um so i think there are some perhaps clues as to why the monster shows up now of course you don't know in the beginning but let's 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 look at how some of that works in 
a clue in Jaws, in this famous scene in Jaws. You were on the Indianapolis? What happened? I was coming back from the island of Tinian to Lady, just delivered the bum, the Hiroshima bum. Which our bomb mission had been so secret, no distress signal had been sent. Very first light, Chief. Sharks come cruising. So we formed ourselves into tight groups. You know the thing about a shark? He's got lifeless eyes. Black eyes, like a doll's eye. And if you, if you, if you listen to that story, that Quinn told. It's, it's a little microcosm, a little mini version of the whole story, right? They formed themselves into groups, clustered together, right, to create a little bit of safe space in the midst of the chaotic waters, and yet the sharks kept coming. Think about the story of Jonah for a second. So, Jonah is not following his purpose, his calling, right? In the beginning of the story. Kind of like Sheriff Brody. There's a sense of running away from something. There's, there's inklings of that in the beginning of the story of Jaws. Kind of like you couldn't make it wherever else you are. So you're moving into Amityville Island thinking that it's going to be easier there. Right? Jonah doesn't want to follow where he's supposed to go. He doesn't want to reach his potential. He doesn't want to use his gifts and calling to make the world a better place. He wants to run away. He wants to hide. And what happens? A storm comes up, right? And there's a sense that that's what happens when you want to avoid your responsibility there are monsters or storms that will find you, right? And so then Jonah um, realizes his guilt and gets thrown overboard by the sailors and he's eaten by a giant fish. And then after he's learned his lesson, he's put up on the beach by the fish. And so there's a sense that the fish, which, I mean, I don't want to go too much into the mythology here, but the fish really represents Tamat, uh, which in Babylonian mythology um, was the dragon that Marduk had to fight in order to create the world. Um, in the Jewish tradition, the story of Jonah is kind of this, has this idea that Tamat does the bidding of Yahweh. So... The monster, the, the fish, is responding to, the, to Jonah's failure to find the right path, right? It's, in, it, it's being controlled by the creator of the universe. It's there for a purpose. The monster has a purpose. So, so people are very confused about the ending. When we get to the ending of Jaws here, I want you guys to remember this. Um, why is Quint so fatalistic? There's a, a very famous story, a uh, very famous question from the movie is he, he bashes the radio, if you remember. There's almost a sense that he wants to get eaten by the shark. And why is that? Is it because he feels that that's the proper end. The sharks were there to punish the Indianapolis in some sense for what? For this, right? They delivered the bomb. And maybe they thought that they could get away with it Maybe Quint thought that he could get away with it, but he's still drawn to the sea. Maybe he, in some sense, thinks that the shark 
is supposed to eat him in punishment for this. Now, that's just a theory. This is a theory that is out there on the internet <laughs> about Jaws. But it's interesting to think about, right? Is there a reason? Think about whenever you watch one of these monster stories. Is there a reason for the monster to show up, right? Okay, this, this word hamartia, that is the Greek word in archery term for missing the mark. Um, and Booker talks about it in terms of Aristotle um, thought of, of hamartia as, as veering off the path. And in the New Testament, the word for sin is hamartia, right? So the idea of sin is going in the wrong direction. And when you do that, there are monsters that show up somehow in the logic of the universe. Monsters will manifest themselves when there are problems with you and the direction that you're going in. I mean, you know this. <laughs> I mean, in, in a very simple sense, right? Um, taking it out of the mythological for a second. If you don't pay your credit card bill and you ignore it and you think it's just going to go away, it's only going to come back and it's going to come back bigger. And if you ignore it again, it's going to come back and it's going to come back bigger. And until finally it will consume you and it will eat you and you will die, right? If you leave that long enough without dealing with it, uh, it, will, it will grow and grow and grow in size. Okay, so I know that that's a, that might seem like a kind of an outlandish theory, but let's, let's take a look at Jurassic Park. Again, fast forward a little bit past halfway and look and see if you can't find a, a reflective scene in these movies where they're saying, where they're really kind of questioning, where did this monster come from? Is it something that I did? You know, isn't that interesting? Jonah, right? The storm shows up. Jonah's out on the boat and he's thinking, is it something that I did? And us moderns, you know, we think, well, you know, that's not how the weather works, right? That's not, that's not how these things work. But I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Here, let's watch this. You know, the first attraction I ever built when I came down from Scotland was a flea circus. But with this place, I wanted to show them something that wasn't an illusion. Having Nedry was a mistake, that's obvious. We're over-dependent on automation. I can see that now. Child. Creation is an act of sheer will. Creation is a sheer act of will. But is it? Remember, we've been talking about creation and how Elohim divides and separates and names and then Adam follows in that, in that blueprint. Is that how habitable order is created? A sheer act of will, or is it by understanding how something works and putting it in its place? Right. I like to think about it in terms of uh, a sports coach, a baseball coach. When the raw recruits so show up, the the coach takes each one, assesses the talent that each one has, and then assigns it a role, gives them a name. So they come out, they come formless and void into this, and then they're created into a body. They're, they're, um, they're assigned roles, and they're given functions, and they are sort of broken down and reborn into the, to the team, right? And that's the, now the team is the habitable order. The team is the environment uh, that, you, that the coach has built. And it's not an act of sheer will, I don't think. It's a, it's a, cooperation with the natural raw potential, the raw talents that those recruits have, and then assigning them roles. So there's something going on with John Hammond here 
that maybe might be a clue, like I said, into um, why the monsters are there, right? Um, so we talked about Hamartia, right, which is missing the mark, uh, going off the path, avoiding responsibility. Now, maybe we could talk about hubris, right? The Tower of Babel, um, or Icarus, right? Flying too close to the sun, uh, trying to overreach. Maybe, um, maybe when you're trying, when you're, when you're trying to overreach, you're neglecting the, the order that you have responsibility for. You know, um, so I think those elements are there. I, I mention all this not to say that there is one reason why these monsters show up. But I'm mentioning it to say that you can certainly look for them. You can look for reasons why these monsters show up. And it, it, it's, it's not necessarily the case that this is just pure evil, unmotivated evil. Although it seems like it, right? It seems like the shark only wants to kill Sheriff Brody and Quinn and, the, and wants to terrorize this town. Um, it seems like the dragon, you know, wants to, um, has, has nothing but evil in its, in its heart. It seems like Grindel uh, in Beowulf has nothing but evil. But um, it's worth asking, you know, is there something that we did wrong uh, that gave rise to these? Okay. So let's get back to the movie here. Um, there's a thread out there. We're not sure why yet, uh, but there's some reason that this threat is is uh, is posed against the border of our habitable order here. And then you've got your foolish, and you've got your mentor. The mentor is saying, "Take this seriously," and the foolish is saying, "Don't worry about it." Okay, let's let's take a look at how this manifests itself in Jaws. Martin, you, you gonna shut down the beaches on your own authority? If the people can't swim here, they'll be glad to swim at the beaches of Cape Cod, the Hamptons, Long Island. You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. Okay. Can't have a panic on our hands on the 4th of July, right? So, uh, yeah, what's the deal with the foolish character here? What's the... What's the... Um... Certainly, the foolish character is unable to see beyond the borders of the of the of the town of the of of the shoreline, right? Um, and they're concerned with that which is goes on inside the realm of order, and they're not really taking seriously the the fragility of anything that has arisen uh, and and it becomes organized. Um, in High Noon here, we're going to look at the fool. Uh, again, uh, the townspeople. Uh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, right? We'll be okay. And that's that's really the thing. We want to believe that. If you just ignore it, it will go away. Um, and so the hero, there's part of the hero, in a sense, that wants to believe that. And that's what these characters represent. Here's Here's High Noon. All right, it's coming off. Cut out the biggest sword. Marshal, telegram for you. They pardon Frank Miller. What is it? I don't Miller? believe it. You get out of this town. Get out of this town this very minute. Come on. Why are you stopping? They're making me run. I've never run from anybody before. Then don't go back, Will. I've got to. That's the whole thing. How many coffins we got? So they got to build some coffins, um, right? So, so in a, in a sense, what you have here is you've got your foolish, your foolish characters, and they are pulling or pushing the hero in this direction, and then you've got some voice um, in Jaws. It's going to be uh, you'll see that it's going to be. Um, Richard Dreyfus uh, in High Noon, it's really just his own conscience that's pushing out towards the confrontation. So there's one side that says, 
just ignore it. It's going to go away. Um, and then the other side says, no, 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 you can't let this go. The idea here is that the foolish wants to keep their head in the sand. They think it's going to work out. Uh, they don't. And then the mentor, of course, is saying, let's, let's look into this. Um, so here, here's how this happens in, in Jaws, uh, uh, in Jurassic Park. Gee, the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here. Um, uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility for it. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. You're all meant to come down here and defend me against these characters, and the only one I've got on my side is the blood-sucking lawyer. This is, this is what's called the dream stage, right? So you've got the advice of the, of the foolish. They say, well, look, we, let's just do the easiest solution, right? So in Jaws, of course, they go out and they catch a shark, right? Um, but Richard Dreyfuss' character is saying, well, hold on a second. I don't know if that, I think maybe this is a bigger threat than you realize, right? Um, so there's this, there's this moment in the dream stage. And remember, like the dream stage is kind of a fantasy world that starts off the story. So you, at first you start with the Garden of Eden, the habitable order, the, the peace and tranquility, and then you see the threat. And then there's various reactions to the threat, right? One of the reactions is to say, um, Sheriff Brody, you know, we've got to close all the beaches. The mayor says, no, 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 no. That's going to ruin our... Um, what we've got going on here inside the town. And then you've got some outside figure, some mentor figure played by Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. And it's um, Jeff Goldblum in um, Jurassic Park and Richard Dreyfuss here in, uh, in Jaws saying, uh, no, um, I think we need to look deeper into this, right? So there's always a symbol in the dream stage of this quick victory that's won, but it's and it seems okay. Seems like oh, we we we've we've reestablished order. We've taken care of the threat. Um, but it's always an underestimation of the threat. Here's Beowulf. Uh, Beowulf pulled off Grindel's arm in the first confrontation that he has with Grindel, not knowing uh, that Grindel's mother is still out there. Right. Um, so they took the arm and they put it up as a trophy in the in the hall. Uh, where they live, where they, um, where their community is, and it was like a a representation of here we got the problem. Here's the monster, right? In 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 Jaws, it's this shark. It's not the it's not the shark. It's a shark, right? And what is it? An alien? Uh, if you remember the very first Alien movie, the alien attacks, and then it just falls off. And then they find this dead alien and they think, oh, huh, I guess we can just study this specimen and uh, everything's going to be okay. Not knowing that it had actually impregnated the person that it attacked, right? And we're in for a surprise later. Um, same thing with Jurassic Park, right? They, they see the dinosaurs. They seem harmless. Oh my gosh, uh, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. That's the dream stage. It always has a, you know, a fantasy dreamlike quality. Okay. So now the mentor is going to make a pitch, make an argument and say, we got to investigate further, right? This, this is a false solution. It's trying to snap the character into reality out of the dream stage. And this is what's going to cause the hero to enter into what's the next phase, which is called the frustration phase. So remember it's anticipation. There's a threat out there. And then there's the dream stage, a false solution. And then there's the frustration stage where you're actually starting to encounter the real problem. Okay, so that's uh, my stopping point for today. Um, I've got plenty, plenty more lecture material to go. And so uh, very soon I'll have part two of Overcoming the Monster up. In the meantime, uh, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. And I hope that you enjoyed. Thanks.